Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Gregory Hannon, VP of AI Research here at Absci. And today I'm really excited to welcome Jeffrey Ruffalo from John Hopkins University. His research is focused on scalable artificial intelligence models and their application to molecular biophysics problems. Today, Jeffrey is going to be discussing the use of deep learning models to predict antibody structures based on massive sets of natural antibodies. With that, I'll hand the controls over to you, Jeff. Great. Yeah, thank you guys so much for inviting me to talk to you today. Um, I'll be sharing our work on antibody structure prediction that we're calling fast, accurate antibody structure prediction from deep learning on a massive set of natural antibodies. And this is work from myself, uh, Li Shin, and Pooja from the lab of Jeffrey J. Gray. Today, I'll talk a little bit about um, a couple of our models. The first is AntiBirdie, which is an antibody specific language model that we've trained for representation learning. And then the main model will be IGFold, which is a model that we've used to predict antibody structures from the representations learned by AntiBirdie. Uh, we can use that model to predict structures end to end in a fast way, as well as estimate the error of those predicted structures, which gives information about their reliability. We can also incorporate known structural information into those predictions. And finally, we've applied the model to a large set of natural antibody sequences uh, to further expand the observed antibody structural space. Before I get too much into the models, I'll talk a little bit about antibody structures, which I'm sure most of the audience here is familiar with. Uh, antibodies are large protein complexes composed of two heavy and two light chains for a conventional antibody. And the role of antibodies is, of course, to bind and neutralize antigens. When we talk about antibody structure prediction, we focus on the FV region here shown in blue, which really forms the context with the antigen. Zooming in on that interaction, the FV binding is really mediated by a set of six complementarity determining region loops called the CDRs, which I've shown here in red. Uh, five of these CDRs are pretty easy to predict the structures of. They adopt a set of canonical folds, and you can usually figure out that fold just from the sequence. But the third CDR loop of the heavy chain, or CDRH3, which I'll talk more about later, uh, really has a lot more structural diversity uh, due in part to its sequence diversity as well as the length diversity of this loop. Uh, but because it plays a really central role in binding the antigen, structural modeling of this loop is pretty critical for um, engineering antibodies and understanding their functions. Historically, uh, researchers have predicted antibody structures by grafting together pieces of previously solved antibody structures. Uh, this is called grafting. It's pretty similar to uh, template modeling or homology modeling for regular proteins. The basic workflow here is to first take your sequences and parse them into their different uh, structural uh, domains. So for the heavy chain, you'd want to find where the CDR H1, 2, and 3 start, and likewise for the light chain. Then you can search those discrete chunks against a database like SABDAB, which collects antibody structures, and finally piece together those templates to form a complete structure. These approaches uh, work pretty well for the CDR loops that adopt canonical folds, but have historically struggled on the H3 because it's hard to find a template for this longer loop. Uh, when you can't find a template, the structural diversity still limits the accuracy. A couple of years ago, we started to think about how we could apply machine learning to this problem of antibody structure prediction. Uh, at the time, deep learning approaches were really treating proteins as images, where for each pixel, you have a measurement describing for two residues how far apart they are or how they're oriented in space. Uh, so we took that kind of approach where we think of an antibody structure as a set of distances and orientations between residues. Then we train a model to go from the sequence to that image-like representation. Uh, and finally, once you have those descriptions of where things should be where things should be relative to each other in space, you can put that into something like Rosetta to come up with actual three-dimensional coordinates. These approaches worked pretty well. They moved the state of the art for antibody H3 loop structure prediction down about half an angstrom to an angstrom on average, uh, but there's still room for improvement. In the time since those methods have been developed, of course, AlphaFold has really revolutionized protein structure prediction. I won't go too much into the details of AlphaFold, but the general idea is to take coevolutionary information in the form of a multiple sequence alignment, and then through a neural network, map that into a 3D structure. So our goal today is to talk about IGFold. And here, the idea is to take the antibody sequence and predict the structure in an end-to-end -end fashion. We want to do this so that we can predict antibody structures quickly. Uh, previous approaches, as well as AlphaFold, tend to be slow and hard to apply to large antibody data sets like you might have early in a discovery campaign. We want to also be able to incorporate, incorporate template information if you have it. So if you know part of your structure, we'd like to pr produce 
a prediction that's consistent with that data. And finally, we want to know if our predictions are likely to be accurate. So we'll have the model estimate its own error. To do this, we want to call on as much data as we can find. Um, although there's only a few thousand antibody structures that have been solved experimentally, there's a vast set of antibody sequences that have been collected through immune repertoire sequencing studies. Um, in those studies, typically you can go one of two directions. You can take your sample and identify antigen-specific antibodies, which might make promising therapeutics. You can also sequence the antibodies within the repertoire, and that's how we get the data sets that we're going to use. For the last couple of decades, um, researchers and companies around the world have been collecting these data sets, which have been aggregated into the observed antibody space by Charlotte Dean's lab at Oxford. This data set contains about a billion um, unpaired antibodies and 100,000 paired antibodies, which we'll use for training our representation learning model. So we want to use these sequences for structure prediction, uh, but of course we don't have structures for them, so we need some other way to extract information from this data set. To do this, we turn to an approach that's pretty common in uh, protein modeling today, which is called mask language modeling or mask residue prediction in our case. Um, the idea here is to take your sequence and then hide some of the residues from your model and task it with predicting what the residue hidden's identity was. So for example, in this case, if I hide this residue, I'd like the model to predict uh, that E goes there. In learning this process, the model can pick up a lot of cues about structure. For example, if I hide a residue within a beta sheet, if the model can learn the propensities of residues within beta sheets, it has a better chance of guessing what goes in that position. And similarly, if the model can learn something about the 3D arrangement of a protein, if I, hide, if I mask one residue, uh, for example, assisting in this conserved disulfide bond, the model should have a better chance of predicting what goes in that position if it's learned something about the 3D arrangement of antibodies. Once we've trained this model, we want to use it to extract representations for a given antibody sequence. To do this, we just take our sequence of interest, encode it in the model, and take the final hidden representation. This is kind of a summary of the sequence that we can use for downstream tasks. Before I get too much into structure prediction, we've done some analysis of these representations to kind of get a sense of what the model has learned from this masked residue prediction task. Here I'm showing um, embeddings for four flu vaccine recipients. Uh, these are people who got the flu vaccine and then shortly after had their antibody repertoire sequenced. Uh, when we encode these in the model and reduce it down uh, to a visualizable space with UMAP, we see this organization that reflects uh, the rules of VDJ recombination. So you see dominant clusters correspond to different V genes. Um, if you zoom in and label with the J genes, again, you see these sort of subclusters within the V genes uh, that describe which J gene uh, the antibody used. And finally, if we go all the way down to the D gene, because these are heavy chains, we can see kind of these micro clusters within the antibody space. We also looked a little bit at whether the embeddings have learned something about structure from this pre-training task. Here I've taken the sequences of all of the paired antibodies in SABDAB, of uh, which there's a few thousand, encoded them in the model and extracted the part of the representation that corresponds to the CDR loops. So for example, for CDR H1, if we take the representation from the sequence that corresponds to the H1 loop, average that down to a fixed size, and then project down to two dimensions with TSNE, we can begin to see some clustering according to the structural um, canonical folds that researchers have previously identified. And you can see similar trends for the H2 loop as well. The H3 loop, we don't have these clusters, so we instead just visualize by length. And you can see that the space is organized by the length of the CDRH3 loop. And we see a similar trend for the light chain CDR loops as well, uh, with some clusters emerging for some of the loops, others not so much. But the model seems to have picked up something about the structure um, of these canonical folds through the pre-training task. Of course, our goal is to uh, predict three-dimensional structures. So it's promising that we have this representation that looks like it can get us there, but we need to build a little bit more on top of it to get to our final um, goal. Here, our model IG fold takes these antibody sequences, encodes them with antibody, and then learns through an end-to-end -end fashion to predict the backbone structure. Once we have that backbone structure, we can put it into Rosetta to add the side chains and work out any uh, discrepancies such as clashes, uh, non-ideal bond angles, and the like. We take an approach where we think of the antibody structure as a fully connected residue graph to start. So this allows the model to uh, learn the associations between residues as well as pass information around the entire sequence and structure. And then finally, we migrate to a 3D coordinate representation, which ultimately yields our prediction. Zooming in a little bit on the model, 
We start with our antibody sequence. This can be a heavy and light chain or just an antibody sequence. We encode that with our antibody model and we pull out the embeddings I mentioned previously, as well as the attention matrices from throughout the transformer model. Uh, these encode information about which residues might need to be associated during the structure prediction task, because if the model has learned to attend to things that are structurally close, for example, it might have already picked up on some of the dependencies in sequence space. So we can use these attention matrices to sort of bootstrap the learning process. Then we proceed through a set of graph transformer and triangle multiplicative update layers um, to update the nodes and edges. Next, if we have a template structure, uh, which I'll mention how we get these during training in a moment, we incorporate that through invariant point attention, which is proposed for AlphaFold. Our implementation is a little bit different than that of AlphaFold because we want to just give the, the model a structure that we know. So rather than have it update that structure, we call the chords fixed and just allow the model to act to collect information using the structure, though it's not yet predicting one. After the template is incorporated, we then start with a coordinate frame at the origin, similar to AlphaFold, and use a set of, another, of invariant point attention layers again to move those coordinates to the final predicted structure. As I mentioned previously, we also want to predict the error in our predictions. Uh, once again, we turn to invariant point attention. It's similar to how we used it for templates, where we pass in the predicted structure by the model, holding the coordinate fixed, and have it predict a per uh, atom deviation from the native structure. Once we've done all this, we can put our predicted structure into Rosetta to work out those non-idealities that I mentioned previously, as well as visualize where the model is likely to be accurate or inaccurate. To train this model, we wanted to use um, more antibody structures than were available in SABDAB. Uh, there's only a few thousand there, but of course we have AlphaFold, which is a highly accurate protein structure predictor. Um, so we took the paired sequences to start from OES. There's about 120,000 and clustered those down to a more manageable population of 16,000. Then using AlphaFold, we produced this synthetic, synthetic structure database that we can use to produce more training data. We also looked to the unpaired antibody sequences, there's about a billion of these. After clustering those down at uh, 40% sequence identity, we're left with about 23,000. Um, and in combination, this is about 10 times the number of non-redundant antibody structures as we would have if we had used crystals. The advantage of using unpaired sequences as well is that we can get better performance on nanobodies where you don't have a heavy and light chain. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that more later, but some models that we developed previously really struggled on nanobodies because they're only trained in the paired context, so they don't see the full conformational um, space accessible when you don't have a light chain. To train the model, we sample evenly between SABDAB, the OAS paired synthetic set, and the OAS unpaired synthetic set. Uh, hi, Jeffrey, just a, a second. We have a question from the chat here. Um, so okay. we, the, how much work did you have to do to decide on this model? Are there other variations you've tried that anecdotally worked less well? Yeah, great question. Um, so the model was really developed while the community was kind of figuring out how it might work before the code and the paper were released. So although the kind of overall architecture uh, was decided pretty early on, we swapped out a lot of these components. For example, the invariant point attention before that was out, we tried things like the EGNN, um, SE3 transformer. We found that they were a lot less um, efficient for the same performance. So a model that might take a week to train using um, EGNN or SE3, we could get down to a couple of days with IPA with significantly less parameters, um, as well as the predicted structure part. So IPA is pretty nice for predicting updates to coordinates, whereas with EGNN, we kind of predict things directly and just aligned them. Um, so yeah, we, we took most of what was, what was published at the time and tried to swap in and out these pieces, but the core idea was pretty consistent. Okay, um, as I mentioned, we sample evenly from our three structured data sets to train our model. Um, every time, of course, we give the model the sequence, but half the time we also give it a template. We come up with these templates by taking the structure from our database and then corrupting it by removing somewhere, anywhere between one and six spans of 20 amino acids. So you can think of this as just randomly dropping out a CDR loop, uh, but we also allow the model or the training process to drop out other regions as well. So it's more robust deletions in the structure. Then the model is tasked with predicting the structure, of course, as well as that error estimate per atom in the backbone. 
our loss is composed of a mean squared error on the coordinates after aligning the framework of the antibody, as well as a bond length loss to try to get things to come together in a more realistic way. And then finally, an L1 loss and the deviation of the backbone atoms in the carbon beta. Once we've trained the model, we also looked at how it sort of assembles the structure using its um, that second stack of IPA layers that I mentioned. So starting with the coordinate at the origin, we find that the model kind of initially gets the 3D uh, relative arrangement of the residues pretty well, although it's in sort of a compact form, uh, before finally at step two, scaling out the residues to their um, actual positions at, at the scale of an antibody structure. And finally, the, the third step of IPA sort of adjusts the um, bond lengths and bond angles to make it look more like a well-formed antibody. Thank I think you. there's and another question. Yeah, another question here. Uh, these losses are different from alpha folds. How did you choose these? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I'll start with the, the error estimation. Um, alpha fold uses uh, the PLDDT, which is more similar to the metrics you might look at for pro general protein structure accuracy. But for antibodies, um, the modeling community has a sort of um, pretty well-defined set of metrics that they usually look at for evaluating models that they're familiar with. So they wanted to predict things that are going to be immediately useful to people who have been using antibody structure predictors before. So typically we want to align the framework residues and measure the RMSD of the heavy atoms um, within the CDR loop. So that's what we train the model to do as well. Uh, for the bond length loss, we found that without this, the model can approximate the structures pretty well, but it tends to kind of take the easy way out for the CDRH3 loop where it might come up with a prediction where things are spatially as close to the native as they can be, but they look pretty unrealistic. So this kind of forces the model to reconcile um, the overall uh, position of the residues, but also put them in an arrangement that looks more like a protein backbone. And then the hardest one to decide on was the mean squared error loss here. Uh, so we tried doing a few things. We started with RMSD, which was what uh, Rosetta Fold did. Uh, we didn't try the uh, loss that AlphaFold uses. Um, it ended up being a little bit too inefficient computationally for our resources. Um, the mean squared error really seemed like a uh, good in-between. So it worked better than RMSD in my experience uh, while being more efficient. Um, so once we have this, this final structure from the model, uh, we refine it, of course, to reduce, to remove those non-idealities I mentioned. Uh, this step really only makes small changes to the structure. Here I'm showing the result from end-to-end -end prediction from IG fold versus its refined counterpart. And you can see for most of the structure, there's really no change. Um, you might see some gradual or some small changes in the H3 loop for moving um, non-realistic torsion angles and fixing bond lengths, but not much in most cases. The cases where this is really necessary is for longer H3 loops. Here, for example, you can see the blue one um, has some clashes, some atoms that are a little bit too close together. That's what we really want Rosetta to fix for us so we can have a, a more realistic structure prediction. To evaluate our model, we took a set of methods spanning grafting-based methods that have been used historically, as well as deep learning methods that can be applied to antibodies. We evaluate by, like I mentioned a moment ago, chopping up the structure into the CDR loops that we want to measure RMSD for, as well as the framework residues. Oops. Uh, for grafting-based methods, um, they can typically achieve sub-angstrom accuracy for both the heavy and light chain frameworks, as well as most of the CDR loops. Uh, but for CDRH3, they tend to have um, uh, worse performance. A couple of antibody-specific deep learning methods have come out over the last year or so. Uh, one is DeepAp that we developed previously, as well as AbLooper from Charlotte Dean's lab. These methods performed better on the CDRH3 loop, as well as got uh, some marginal improvements on the other CDR loops. And then finally, AlphaFold Multimer can also predict antibody structures. Um, here we see a decent improvement on the H3 loop, um, nothing too significant, uh, but it does perform well on these despite being trained on all proteins. When we add IgFold in, we see its performance looks pretty similar to AlphaFold Multimer, uh, which makes some sense because it was trained on a lot of AlphaFold predictions. Um, but the main distinguishing factor between these methods is the speed. For grafting-based methods, you're really trading off accuracy for uh, really high throughput prediction. You can typically predict these um, in a few seconds, definitely under a minute. 
For the antibody specific methods, you get a little bit more accuracy, but the time goes up. Uh, for ab looper, it's about a minute. For keepab, it's up to 10 minutes per sequence. For alpha fold multimer, you're getting good accuracy, but it can take anywhere between 30 minutes and two hours to get your structure prediction uh, based on how many inputs the model you want to use and what kind of resources you have access to. And then finally, for IG fold on a CPU machine, we can predict these structures in less than a minute, uh, meaning that you can predict a lot more structures uh, given a modest compute budget. We also compared the individual predictions between IG fold and alpha fold. Uh, despite having pretty similar performance and IG fold being trained on predictions from alpha fold, we see that in a lot of cases, they predict pretty different confirmations. Here I'm showing the H3 RMSD from native for alpha fold predictions on the X versus IG fold and the Y. And you can see a lot of points in this far off diagonal space. So these are cases where, for example, for this point, IG fold was about seven angstroms from the crystal structure and alpha fold was about one angstrom. In practice, what this looks like uh, is pretty distinct confirmations. For example, in this case, alpha fold in red uh, is pretty close to the native, whereas IG fold is a pretty uh, distinct confirmation. Then, of course, there's points on both sides of the diagonal. So in some cases, IG fold is really close to the native, whereas alpha fold predicts a pretty distinct confirmation. Distinguishing these cases is where the error prediction comes in handy. So here I'm showing the predicted RMS3, RMSD for the H3 loop versus the actual RMSD from the crystal structure. And we see a strong relationship between the predictions um, and the actual RMSD. If I put this on structures, um, you can see that in some cases, the model will have a pretty poor prediction. For example, in this case, where you have this long H3 loop with this beta sheet domain in the middle of the loop. Uh, the model kind of predicts this wide open loop, uh, but it associates it with a high predicted error. In other cases with long H3 loops, uh, the model does get a good, make a good prediction. And here you see a correspondingly low error. So although long loops tend to be more error prone, the model isn't just uh, kind of learning a regression on the loop length. It's actually learning something about how well it data, its data supports the prediction. Uh, so it's more informative than just thinking a long loop is going to have higher error. When we look at this metric for other CDR loops, we see similar trends. Um, the method or metric tends to be pretty informative for all of the loops. Um, one exception where we, we don't see a significant correlation is for CDRL2. Uh, most of these loops are predicted sub angstrom to begin with, except for this one outlier, which the model thought would be accurate but ended up not being. A big shortcoming of some antibody specific deep learning methods that came out previously was that it didn't work for single domain antibodies very well. So we wanted to see if we could use IG fold to kind of accelerate nanobody structure prediction while maintaining good accuracy. Uh, here I'm gonna show results for a similar set of methods that we looked at for paired antibody structure prediction, starting with our grafting-based method, a bodybuilder. Uh, you can see that for nanobodies, again, we can typically achieve sub-angstrom accuracy for the framework. We see a little bit of drop-off for the CDR1 and 2 versus paired antibodies. Uh, this is due in part because there's just fewer nanobody structures in the structural databases, so there's fewer templates to choose from. And for the CDR3, we really see this uh, wide range of prediction accuracies um, because nanobodies tend to have or can have very long CDR3 loops. You really exacerbate the issues that graphene based methods had with uh, paired heavy chain H3 loops um, and see this widespread in performance. Our previous method, DBAB, can in principle predict nanobody structures, though it was trained only on paired. Uh, we see improvements to CDR1 and 2 versus grafting-based methods. But for CDR3, we actually see significantly worse performance. This is because, as I mentioned, it's only trained on paired sequences and structures. So it never sees um, the conformational uh, conformations accessible when you don't have a light chain. It always predicts structures that kind of uh, look like they're paired, even if you don't give it a light chain. Uh, AlphaFold performs remarkably well on nanobodies, we find. Uh, CDR1 and 2. It's pretty comparable, but a bit better than the previous approaches. And then for CDR3, we see a significant uh, improvement over grafting or DBAP. And then IG fold, we see again, good performance on CDR1 and 2, but a degradation versus alpha fold, uh, despite training on alpha fold structures. When we look at what the structures actually look like in practice, we find that sometimes IG fold can get the correct CDR3 confirmation. In this case, we have what's called a stretch twist confirmation where the CDR3 loop is sort of folded down 
against the beta sheet. Um, IG fold lands the loop in this confirmation while alpha fold doesn't. Um, but where we find IG fold really struggles is when you have um, secondary structure within the CDR loops. So in this case, you have this uh, CDR3 loop um, that has a small alpha helix kind of in the middle. Um, alpha fold, which has been trained uh, to predict protein structures in many contexts, uh, figures out that there should be a helix here. Whereas IG fold, which really doesn't see a lot of alpha helices to begin with, uh, gets the overall location of the loop correct, but really has this sort of unstructured fold. We can also use our error estimations for nanobodies, of course. Um, again, we see pretty uh, strong correlations between the actual RMSD of each CR loop with the predicted RMSD. Uh, here I'm just showing our nanobody benchmark. Uh, you can see that the model doesn't suffer from the same problems that I mentioned for DFAB. Um, it predicts a variety of confirmations instead of just predicting them as if they were with paired sequences or paired structures. Um, and the error estimations tend to be reliable. The next thing we looked at was whether we can incorporate known structural information into the prediction. So here, this might be useful if you're um, working on designing a new antibody from a parent. So if you have a structure for your parent antibody, but you're going to redesign the H3 loop, for example, it would be nice to incorporate what you know about the antibody to begin with and build a model of your, your designed antibody that um, is consistent with that data, uh, but predicts the H3 loop onto it. So to test this, we take um, our antibody benchmark and just delete the H3 loops. And then we pass those uh, remaining coordinates to the model as templates and ask it to predict the whole structure. Uh, I'm showing three different strategies here. The first is just standard IG fold where we're not providing any structural information. Next is IG fold given everything except the H3. And then finally, IG fold if we give it the whole FV. Um, you can see in most cases, um, if you provide the structure, you get to sub angstrom accuracy. Um, for the one where we don't provide the H3 loop, uh, it doesn't look like there's much change here, but I'll zoom in a little bit more later. And of course, when we give the H3 loop, the model can get um, sub angstrom predictions typically. The useful part is that if IG fold was going to uh, produce an error prone prediction for one of the CDR loops, but you have the structure, rather than rely on something like grafting to fix these uh, with a lot of manual work, IG fold can. Um, with its template capabilities, sort of incorporate all of that information into its prediction for free. For the H3 loop, we find that although the, the overall performance doesn't shift much, there are a handful of cases where providing the rest of the framework and the CDR loops can yield a meaningful improvement in H3 accuracy. For example, in this case, when we give everything except the H3, um, the prediction ends up being much closer uh, to the actual crystal structure, although it still struggles with uh, this ordered beta sheet domain. We can do the same thing for nanobodies. We see a similar uh, trend when we give everything except the CDR3 when we give the FB. Um, there's fewer cases where this makes a big difference. Uh, one interesting case is this point down here. Uh, when we zoom in on this, we find that by giving the model the uh, framework, it actually better aligns the C terminal domain of the CDR3 loop, which allows it to improve from about two angstroms to about one angstrom. So not much, but improving or providing that context can give you some improvements from antibodies as well. Uh, I'd like to give a little more context for why we tested the FV, uh, providing all of the FV. So although this isn't um, practically useful for structure prediction, because if you have the structure, you don't need to predict it. We think this might be more useful for putting together embeddings for your antibody. Uh, with the BERT embeddings, we know they contain some structural context, but here we really have um, an embedding that has that BERT context with the structure infused. So this might be more useful for downstream model training. After validating our model, we wanted to uh, predict structures for a larger set of antibodies sequences that are, that are available in databases like SABDAP. So we went back to OAS and collected the 120,000 paired sequences, clustered those down to 95% sequence identity just to remove things that are very, very similar. That yielded about 105,000 paired sequences, which we then predicted with IG fold. Um, as you can see with this histogram down here, most of them are predicted to be quite accurate. Um, so these structures, oops, sorry, have you tried using the embeddings for downstream model training? Yeah, great question. Um, we haven't done too much with it yet, 
But I think any application that's using BERT models, for example, some people are using BERT models for paratope prediction. I think any case where you're doing something that's fundamentally reliant on the structure should be improved. I don't uh, see a scenario where having the structure would be uh, would ever be a detriment. Um, similarly, humanization might be useful because uh, there you're trying to um, say something about how the body might react to an antibody. So having the structure in that context could be useful as well. Um, so once we've put together this synthetic structure database, if we compare it to SABDAB at similar uh, sequence redundancy, it represents a 40-fold expansion um, in terms of structures that we have access to. And we can perform this calculation on a pretty modest compute budget of about two and a half thousand CPU hours. Looking forward, uh, we think IGFold will be useful for existing antibody design pipelines. If you're doing rational design of binding interactions or docking, having a better starting structure should be useful. The error estimations can also kind of uh, tell you areas where you should be cautious during your design process. And then for more immunological studies, we think this model's speed and accuracy will allow us to kind of transition from thinking of antibodies just as sequences to really structures that exist within the body. Uh, we've done some work on trying to uh, use BERT to understand what's going on within antibody repertoires. Um, and we're excited to see how we can incorporate structure prediction into these, uh, into our thought process as well. To summarize a bit, um, IGFold allows you to take an antibody sequence and predict a structure in less than a minute. Uh, it doesn't require uh, state-of-the-art computational uh, resources. You don't need GPUs to get this time. You can do it on the CPU machine. The predictions from IGFold um, are state-of-the-art. They match those of AlphaFold for paired antibody structures, though they do lag behind for nanobodies. And with our predictions, we have these informative error estimations. So you can know, for example, if your CDRH3 loop is likely to be reliable or not. Uh, all the code is available online on GitHub, as well as installable on PyPy. I'll wrap up by just acknowledging everybody in the lab who contributed to this work, including my advisors, Jeffrey Gray and Jeremiah Sulam, as well as Pooja Mahajan and Li Shin Chu, and then finally Richard, who worked with me um, in the lab while I was doing most of the IG full development um, over the summer in the last year. I'm happy to take any other questions. All right. Thanks a lot, Jeffrey, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, we have some time now for questions. If you have a question, please feel free to press the raise hand button at the bottom of the screen and I'll come to you real time. Um, a pop-up will appear asking you to unmute, which you'll need to click before we can hear you. If you prefer to enter your question, use the Q&A window, that works as well, and I can ask them out loud. Uh, and if you think of any questions after today's presentation, you can always reach out to Jeffrey or myself directly. All right. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll start with one myself there. Um, I'd be curious about where you see this going in terms of uh, the next and important steps here, particularly my mind goes to representing the antigen on the other side of the equation for a lot of these binding problems and how one would model that or, or work with uh, affinity, specificity, and, and, and docking, a lot of the related challenges. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I think there's two main directions I think antibody structure needs, prediction needs to move in. One is, of course, docking, uh, predicting the complex with the antigen, as you mentioned. I think the challenge there is really the data that are available. Um, the approach we took here to overcome the data shortage is to use AlphaFold for antibody uh, producing a synthetic structure database, because I'm sure people at AppSci are aware AlphaFold really can't be used uh, to do that for antibody antigen complexes. So uh, training a model to quickly produce those, um, I think will require people to get a little bit more creative with how you produce the data. Um, the other main area I think that we need to address is the conformational diversity of CDR loops. Although a lot of H3s don't really move that much upon binding, there are some that move significantly when they come in contact with their antigen. So I think something that um, rather than produce kind of a one-to-one -one output for a sequence, it can incorporate some variation into the process would be more useful. So there you can think of modeling an ensemble of antibody structures that you can sample from rather than just a fixed structure. All right, thank you. Uh, another question we have here uh, uh, about the CPU resources uh, for, for running this. Uh, uh, is this something that's running on a single node or using a lot of CPUs? Great question. Um, so when I when I produced the large scale antibody structure database, each structure was given just two CPU cores. Um, I don't remember specifically 
but they're not anything super fancy. I think the cluster was built in 2020. Um, and those can be produced in about a minute. Um, I see another question about the language model. Yeah. How important is the language model? Have you tried ablating it? And what would a, a deeper language model perform? It, would that be better? Um, how about a general protein language models like ESM trained on Unipro? Yeah. So we're in the process of ablating the language model for IGFold. Um, but I can start by giving a little bit of context for DBAP, where we used a pretty simple LSTM encoder to provide some sequence context to the structure predictor. There we found that with and without that, you got about a quarter angstrom um, improvement when you added it to the model. Here, I'm currently testing, just replacing the uh, BERT model with uh, CNN, similar to what we use for DBAP, to see if it can just learn. Because we have more structures, maybe it doesn't need kind of that boost from the language model. Um, we haven't tried general protein language models. I think there the issue for us is really compute resources. For example, if we add something like ESM1B, then we're taking our model from um, a 25 million parameter BERT model that we have now up to a 650 million parameter model, if I remember correctly. So it really extends the training process. Um, and I think deeper models, it would be really interesting to see, but I don't know that we have the resources to test that. And that gets to the next question here, which is uh, roughly how long does it take to train these models uh, and, and the kind of hardware you're working with? Yeah, so for the BERT model, it takes about a week on four A100 GPUs. Uh, we train on about 550 million antibody sequences, and we can go over those about 10 times in that uh, training period. And then for IG Fold, it takes about uh, 70 hours to go over our 44,000 antibody structures. Um, I think we do 2 million training set steps. All right, I, I have another question myself about um, the, the use a lot of AlphaFold in here. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'd be interested to think AlphaFold, if it's not in itself a perfect production of, of the structure, do you think training on it is, is um, essentially, are you picking up the consistent signal despite that? Or is it something that where if the, obviously if you had a, an improved structure predictor there, it would make it easier downstream? Yeah, I think it, it would definitely be better to have um, something more accurate than AlphaFold for these uh, synthetic structure databases, but because uh, what we have is awful fold, we wanted to take advantage of it. I will say that when we remove SABDAB from this training regime, we see a uh, significantly degraded performance um, to the order of, I believe, about half to one angstrom um, degradation for H3 loops. So having the, the real structures really is valuable here because alpha fold isn't, isn't perfect, like you said. Mm -hmm. I think where alpha fold is useful is kind of expanding um, this, this pretty narrow distribution of sequence and structures that's in SABDAB to more accurately reflect the antibodies it's likely to encounter in practice. Uh, with DBAB, you kind of have a rigid model. It's only trained on about 1,700 structures. So it's pretty easy to surprise it with the new antibody. But when we can incorporate these uh, more diverse 40,000 structures from AlphaFold, um, even if the model isn't getting perfect details on where this H3 loop is, um, it learns something about the space of antibodies that it's going to encounter when you apply it in practice. Another question we have here is more general question. Uh, what interests you about antibody structure prediction and where are you heading in your research? Yeah, great question. Um, I think the interesting thing for me personally in antibody structure prediction is how we can kind of make this transition from thinking of antibodies as sequences to structures. Um, there's been a lot of interesting work looking at immune repertoires where if you have structures for the sequences in the repertoire, you can kind of find antibodies that are going to behave similarly. Uh, there was a paper from Charlotte Dean's lab where they took um, some known COVID antibodies and then went to repertoires and found other antibodies that had similar paratopes, even though they had pretty divergent um, sequences in both the paratope and the rest of the, the framework. Uh, so I think structure kind of opens doors to a lot of questions that would be hard to answer before. Um, and then, of course, antibody design is also interesting. I think we still need some tooling in the complex prediction area to really have that move forward in a significant way. Uh, but hopefully, this is a step towards that. Along those lines, do you have any thoughts on, on how we might address some of the bigger challenges around the developability of these antibodies? So getting the structure is a, is a great precursor to affinity. But of course, immunogenicity and a lot of other challenges we're bringing them to, to the clinic are still in the way. Yeah, um, I would say for immunogenicity that you mentioned, 
I think that the natural antibody databases, um, at least from prior work uh, which Richard really uh, drove forward, it seems like you can get a lot of value for predicting immunogenicity just from learning what a natural antibody response looks like. Uh, so in that project, we trained a generative model on the same data set as we trained BERT on. We find that it produces sequences that really don't look immunogenic when we evaluate them with uh, tools that kind of compare them against um, uh, T cell uh, peptide binding, as well as uh, this humanness score that kind of chops it up into fragments and looks at how likely it is to have occurred in a repertoire. Uh, so I think I'm optimistic that we can get immunogenicity figured out just from the data we have now. For developability, it's a little bit more of a challenge, at least working in the public domain, because there's not a lot of high quality data out there. Uh, the data that is out there tends to be kind of focused on one or two antibodies, so it's hard to build a general model there. Um, one thing that might be possible is to kind of take a similar approach and use synthetic data to bootstrap your process. So if you can use something like the SAP score calculator, um, it's been out for a while, perhaps you can learn something about what could cause an antibody to aggregate. And then based on that weak signal, then kind of adapt it to these specific data sets that we have now to build a more general model that performs well. Um, hopefully the embeddings from IG Fold will be useful there. Um, I'm not sure if you need structure prediction exactly for that problem, but I think having structurally um, infused embeddings would definitely be adv advantageous over just something like BERT. Thank you. Uh, maybe one more question I, I have for myself is uh, you mentioned a few times the the, the training um, limitations in terms of you know these are obviously very large models and and difficult to to scale. Uh, did you mm -hmm. notice any scaling loss though in your performance? Uh, is there some thought that if you could go a lot bigger, it would uh, improve the results? Yeah, good question. Um, if I go back to the architecture, the main place I investigated uh, scaling was in this initial stack of graph transformer and edge update layers, mm -hmm. and then also in these two IPA stacks where we're incorporating templates and then predicted the structure. Uh, for this first stack, um, I scaled it up from two to about five or six, and beyond four, the performance pretty much was stagnant, so I just reduced it to four for efficiency. Um, for the template structure incorporation, this one was pretty critical. Um, not only the number of layers, but also the uh, attention heads that you give the IPA was really important. Um, in fact, if you if you reduce it, here we use eight attention heads for this template operation. If you reduce it to four, the model basically ignores the template. So you really need um, just enough capacity, I think, to incorporate things well. And if you're shy of that, then it doesn't really learn much. Um, I also tested two versus three layers of IPA here, and that didn't make too much of a difference, so I went with two. Uh, for the structure um, realization from the coordinates of the origin to the final prediction, um, here again, I scaled it from one up to four. Um, three and four didn't make too much of a difference, so I kept it at three. But it seems like you need just enough capacity for the model to learn things about antibodies, but it's not learning. Um, I, I think these, these properties aren't that hard to learn relative to general protein. So I don't expect as much improvement from scaling. I think the real place to drive improvements is in the data and also the task you're um, trying to learn. So if we were trying to learn this um, confirmationally aware model where you might have um, a distribution of structures represented by the model that you can sample from, maybe they're having a little bit more capacity would be useful um, but I think you have to solve some data issues first. All right, thank you, Ed. Uh, what are, okay, here we have another question as well. Um, so with regard to the improvements in data, do you mean uh, non-predicted structures? Um, it could be either. So for this work, for AlphaFold, we just used the top rank model. I think if you wanted to build something that's confirmationally where you could get more value just by showing the model examples where something might adopt different confirmations, even if those don't accurately reflect the ensemble that you would have um, experimentally, it might be useful just to kind of uh, disassociate this one-to-one -one mapping into something that's um, a landscape. Um, in terms of non-predictive structures, I think, of course, more of those will be useful. We haven't done a comprehensive study of, uh, at least recently, of how many different confirmations exist for similar antibodies in a database like SABDAB. I expect there's some variability, particularly surrounding therapeutic antibodies that have tons of structures. 
where you might see for one sequence or a set of very similar sequences that it can adopt a variety of uh, CDR loop confirmations. Uh, so having more data there would definitely be useful. Uh, but it might be at a place where you could you could achieve that now just from a combination of alpha fold and those cases where you do have multiple structures for the same sequence. With regard to expanding the data challenge, uh, could you foresee utility in combining this with some of the energy model approaches? Uh, yeah, either deep learning representations of energy functions, um, something to essentially augment uh, the, the data information there. Oh, that's a good question. I'm not too familiar with energy-based um, modeling, so I don't think I have a good answer for you. Uh, but I've, I've started to see some interesting uh, structure prediction models going down that approach. All right. Uh, looks like that's the, the other questions we have for today. I uh, want to thank you again. And uh, thanks to our speaker, Jeffrey Ruffalo, for presenting to us today. Uh, and thanks to everyone who joined for participating as well. Um, have a great rest of your day and keep an eye out for our future editions of ABSI Invite seminar series.